Hidden in every storybook, upside down and backwards round, tucked within the afterward lie the secrets dark and true that fill the pages of the Book of Scary. Preparation took years. I had to prove I could be trusted. I didn't always know I was getting ready. At first I was only doing my various chores to survive the monotony of life at the village. Mondays, sweep the halls in the stepsister's wing. Tuesdays, stepmother's wing. Wednesdays, take the bio waste to the incineration bay. Animal waste only. Human waste to be handled only by the stepmothers. Thursdays, check the traps for mice. Empty. Always. Smart little creatures. This was my schedule for most of my life at the village. Otherwise, my time was my own. I spent much of it by myself. But sometimes I visited subjects in other wings. Strictly speaking, I wasn't allowed to talk to anyone outside the Ella wing. But I wasn't important enough to be stopped. As long as I behaved, the stepsisters never kept a close eye on me. I had been there since I was 13. A relatively brief time by comparison. Other Ellas were taken from all over the world as soon as they were born, 32 years ago. They never knew their parents, and grew up not knowing where they lived in a laboratory. I didn't know why I was brought there either. But the stepmothers placated me with lies in the beginning. For some reason, it took them longer to track me down. I actually had the chance to know my parents. Bad luck that mother and father died separately of different diseases. When the stepmothers came to take me from the youth home, they told me I was at risk too, and I believed them. But as time went on, certain questions started to eat at me. Why so many tests? Why so many pills? So many other kids there. Why couldn't we go outside? The answers wouldn't come from the doctors we knew as our stepmothers. They came from the godmothers. Only we called them godmothers. The godmothers were formerly village staff until something broke them. Was it exposure to us? Or was it stricken consciences? You can't keep 250 human beings in a cold, dimly lit facility their entire lives and sleep well at night. The godmothers had their own wing. They took different pills, and there were no tests for them. They were meant to be forgotten. But sometimes they would tell me things. It could be hard to make sense of those things. The godmothers lived in a dense fog of drugs and dementia. But they all desperately wanted me to do something. And slowly, those lunatic fragments started to fit. It was the godmothers who told me the first truth I had ever known about myself. They told me about the village, about the mice. I learned the village wasn't built for the Ellas. It was just the safest place to keep us all. Before we came along, it was a playground for military experiments. Of course it was. Weapons development was part of their game. One of their signatures was a material of fibers too delicate to be handled even by machines, but extremely resistant to heat and impact. They had to genetically engineer mice just to weave it. And then the mice escaped. The same mice I could never catch. They never fell for the traps, but would visit the godmother who used to feed them. They would bring him tools. He gave them his breakfast. He said they understood his words. Someday, he would tell me, he'd use the tools to break out of there and let us all go. He'd say this and then cry before he fell asleep in his chair. From another, I learned there was a way out of the village. Not an easy way, but it could be done. All it took was precise timing and protection. 
Without both, you'd fail, and failure very likely meant death. She said the only unguarded exit was the incineration bay, but I knew that whatever came out of there was destroyed by fire at the exit point. Even if you somehow survived, the ground itself was electrified. But how was it deactivated? What if the incineration bay needed maintenance from the outside? Simple enough. The stepsisters kept boots in their lockers that would allow them to walk past the outer perimeter, but only at specific times each night. Once outside, employees had until midnight to go back indoors. If they were late, if they didn't remove the boots, something bad would happen. What? She wouldn't say, and when I asked her again, she became hysterical, and I had to leave. She once told me to keep out of the sun, and I laughed. It wasn't as if we had the opportunity. When she told me about the reptiles waiting for the big light to let them out, I wrote her off as crazy. But her words stuck with me. A big light lit up the earth the night we were all conceived. I read that in a faded newspaper another godmother gave me for my 18th birthday. Thirty-two years ago, at 12 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, the sky turned white for one second all over the planet. No one ever learned why. Not officially. The rest isn't as obvious in the periodicals of the day. But if you scour the small-town gazettes, the fringe publications, the seemingly unrelated medical journals... You can put the pieces together that we were born nine months later, to the second. Normal by all appearances, but only 250 of us were born alive. When they took us away and brought us to the village, they labeled us E-L-L-A, and never told us what it meant. They refused us light. We monitored our every move. Why? I couldn't talk about my suspicions. There wasn't anyone you could trust, especially not the other Ellas. You never knew who had an arrangement with a stepsister for better food, or who didn't believe things could be better, who thought you might ruin what they had. You sometimes saw subjects try something brave. They were always found out, or ratted out, sold out. Then you never saw them again. But they didn't have a plan like I did. They didn't work at it for years. They didn't befriend the godmothers. They didn't ingratiate themselves to the stepsisters until the stepsisters thought them too docile to ever attempt an escape. My plan was carefully worked out. I made friends with godmother Jack's mice. In exchange for bread, they stole fibers of the material they used to weave, and they made a little prison for me. It took months to complete. But in those months, I set my stage in the incineration bay, arranging those neon orange biohazard barrels so that no one would notice if an extra were to appear on the belt. I picked a stepsister and watched her closely. I learned all her passcodes, practiced breaking into her locker. I found the boots I'd been told were necessary for surviving the walk outdoors. They looked like the snow boots I'd worn as a child, oversized and puffy looking but not half so innocent. When the day of my escape finally arrived, I said goodbye to my favorite godmother. She was a quiet one, but she said two words to me before I left. Before midnight. I told her I understood. Then I put on my stolen boots and the bomb-proof ball gown my furry friends made for me, and I climbed into the biohazard barrel I'd left waiting in the incineration bay. I waited all afternoon and evening for my window of freedom to come. At 11.50 p.m., the evening's incineration program began. I felt the belt move. I heard the bay doors open. I heard the roar of flames obliterating the container all around me. Me in my new foil dress? I felt a little warm. Still uncertain, I waited for a few seconds longer than I should have, huddled there on the dust platform, not sure if I'd really survived this. The sound of the bay doors thudding to a close again reminded me that my time was running out, and I threw off the shroud. I ran. The distance from the dust platform to the far perimeter was a hell of a lot farther than I expected it to be, and I had waited too long to make my start. But I ran. 
In the moon's searing spotlight, I ran, those unexpectedly stiff boots bruising the soles of my feet with every step. The fence was in sight when the warning blast sounded. I had been cautioned about this. Thirty seconds remained to reach the fence, climb it, and remove the boots before some unknown disaster would strike. Twenty seconds. Ten seconds. Five seconds. One. I have failed. No one told me, at least no one had been coherent enough to articulate, that each boot contained a bed of glass between the layers of the insoles. The insoles were thick, but if the boot was exposed to certain elements for a very specific period of time, those insoles would rapidly disintegrate and the glass would break, driving razor-sharp fragments into the foot of the wear. No one was meant to leave this place whole. I don't remember what happened immediately after the pain. All I know is that I wound up back in the village to new quarters that were dark and cold. The rules were enforced more strictly now. I couldn't leave my room or speak to anyone. New pills were added to my daily regimen. That changed three days later when a passing taxi blew a tire and its driver found broken glass in the tread. He followed a trail of fragments along the road to a discarded, blood-soaked boot bearing a Village Institute logo on one side, probably tossed down the hill by a panicked stepsister, most likely the one I'd been studying. One thing led to another, and the boot wound up in the hands of Representative Harold Raines, the very congressman who'd been waiting for the right evidence to rain hell upon a government facility long suspected of abuses. A raid followed, and an injured subject was sought to match the bloody boot. The stepmothers tried to hide me, but it happened too fast. There's a famous photo of me squinting in the glare of the sun as the lab was shut down. Me with my bandaged foot, shielding my eyes with a copy of my own file, a file I'd never been allowed to read before. And holding my hand, supporting my broken figure, is Representative Harold Raines. I became the face of the transparency movement, my timid smile on the cover of every serious magazine. The congressman, my rescuer, soon became my husband. In a few months, I'll have our first child. A happy ending for all. But the child isn't his. My file says that the seed is dormant until a host's maturation. Gestation begins upon a mature human body's first exposure to strong light, such as the sun. Not unlike the way we, as hosts, were created. This is the nature of an ELLA. I finally know what it stood for. Endolarvae. Light accelerated. I am seven months along with my own killer, implanted in me by that alien light at the same moment I was conceived thirty-odd years ago. In time it will consume me and take my form. The congressman knows because he, too, was once a child of the light. But the stepmothers were never able to get their hands on him while he was human. Powerful parents, I suppose. The thing that is my husband has explained it all to me, and I'm not afraid. This creature inside me has a strong will to survive. It always has, even when it was just a microscopic speck. But its voice was quieter then. Not so now. Now its thoughts are my own. It drives me to seek out other hosts. It tells me what we must do to ensure its survival and propagation. It will take over the planet, along with every other of its species. It will create more of its kind. Humanity will be phased out. Our human fairy tale will come to a close, and the end will be a once upon a time to the new children of the light, as they go on to touch every star in the sky. I'm surprisingly okay with this. In fact, I'm all aglow.